So I am going to start in the aftermath of the Battle of Arras in uh, May 1917. Now, as Spencer Jones mentioned in his talk earlier, the battle kind of comes to a less than ideal conclusion for the British Expeditionary Force. And Brigadier General John Kennedy, who is commanding the 26th Infantry Brigade in 9th Division, reports after the battle that whilst his men had, in his words, perfected the attack against an enemy trench system, they didn't know what to do when it broke down into semi-open and open warfare. And Kennedy believed that the old regular army, who had been taught to advance by fire and manoeuvre, would have actually gained far more ground than the BEF managed at Arras. Now, key to the state of affairs was collective training, which put simply is where soldiers were taught to act as part of a section, a platoon, company, and larger formations on the battlefield. Now, the importance and effectiveness of collective training in the BEF in 1917 has frequently been identified by historians Tim Cook talks about it key in the Canadian Corps at Vimy Ridge, Nick Lloyd at Passchendaele, Prower and Wilson at Passchendaele and similar. Generally though, these accounts tend to be very brief and either cover single formations or single operations. And what I'm trying to do here is kind of coalesce all of collective training in 1917 and show how it influenced the British Army's performance throughout the year or the BEF's performance throughout the year. And I'll do this in three stages. So first, I'll very briefly examine the collective training recruits received whilst they are in Britain before they arrived at the front. Next, I'll examine how training actually worked at the front once they arrived there. And lastly, the positive and negative ways in which this helped prepare British soldiers for battle. Hopefully, I will convince you that in 1917, the British Army's approach to collective training was more than capable of creating effective soldiers on the battlefield. And this was key to many of the BEF's most notable successes, particularly in trench warfare, hence the title of this piece. At the same time, though, uh, weaknesses amongst the, well, a disconnect between the BEF's high command's approach to battle and the training system they had at their hands often led to major difficulties and weaknesses in training becoming exacerbated, which contributed to poor performance on the battlefield. Now, before we go in depth, it's important to set out some terminology, because in a very confusing state of affairs, the British Army used the word exercise to refer to a very specific form of collective training, which is a nightmare to write and speak around. So, Collective training as a whole involves schemes. These were then divided pre-war into maneuvers and exercises. Now officially, maneuvers were operations between opposing forces in which both sides were allowed freedom of maneuver. If the attackers and defenders in an operation could decide what they wanted to do on a whim, it was a maneuver. Anything else was an exercise. So usually in an exercise, the defenders would um, have a preconceived script, whereas the attackers could show initiative. Um, on manoeuvres, I recommend Simon Batten's futile exercises, I should say. But for reasons that I just do not understand and can't find any answer for, manoeuvres were widely abandoned by the British Army in August 1914 during the war, and instead they go more exclusively to exercises. I think it's just because manoeuvres were more complicated to organise, but I can't be sure. Then, in 1915, a new third category of collective training emerges, which is the rehearsal attack. Now, this is just basically an evolution of exercises, which involved men practising the exact roles they were to perform in a coming, an upcoming operation over a direct replica of the ground they were to, to attack over. Now this was possible due to trench warfare because the extended planning time it took to plan operations and the fact the enemy positions were fixed allowed detailed operational plans to be worked out in advance and the enemy positions to be located and planned for. For example, there was no way for the BEF to predict where they'd be fighting the Battle of Mons or how they'd be fighting it, whereas the Battle of Luce was the culmination of months of planning. Just as importantly was the advent of aerial photography, 
which allowed enemy defences to be identified and marked out at a hitherto impossible level of detail. So throughout this speech, I'll be talking about exercises and rehearsals. Next, moving on to the benefits of collective training. These were numerous, but I've grouped them into two categories. First is the effect on tactical cohesion, which is the action or fact of forming a united whole. Now for the infantry, they had to act cohesively together with one another, but also with artillery, cavalry, tanks, and other arms on the battlefield. Strong tactical cohesion allowed them to operate together effectively, whereas poor tactical cohesion would see attacks break down and become disjointed. The second major area where collective training affected the infantry was the staying power of an operation. So the ability to maintain an activity or commitment despite fatigue or difficulty, such as heavy casualties. The better a staying power, the more an operation would endure in the face of these losses. So moving on to collective training in Britain in 1917 for recruits, it was quite simply very ineffective, or as one account calls it, a complete washout. Now, one problem was the reduced quantity of time recruits spent training in 1917. Due to the BEF's desperate need for men at the front, basic training had been reduced to 14 weeks, which simply wasn't long enough to create a fully trained soldier. For example, a recruit in 1917 spent 81 hours in physical training, provided the intended syllabus was followed, compared to 120 hours physical training for a pre-war regular. And it's similar across the board. There is a massive reduction in the total time they spend training in each area. Quality was also a significant problem. Now, recruits were trained in small batches, so there were too few men to do large-scale exercises um, or collective training schemes in Britain. But more significantly, what they did perform was generally pretty poor. Frequently, there was no enemy present, and the recruits, who by definition had never been in battle, were simply expected to, ima expected to imagine what it was like being under fire and act accordingly. Noakes, F.E. Noakes, complained about unrealistic manoeuvres in which the enemy was entirely imaginary, and nobody seems to have a very clear idea of what we were supposed to do. He also noted in a very British tradition, we never fail to capture our objective in good time to return for dinner. <laughs> now, nor does it appear, though it's somewhat difficult to disprove, that many schemes involved combined arms warfare. I certainly haven't come across any accounts of artillery or tanks or anything like that featuring in these schemes. So the tactical cohesion recruits developed in Britain was of minimal value. And it's no surprise that when they arrived at the front, most formations remarked that their drafts were completely untrained. Regarding staying power then, another weakness was uh, collective training didn't condition recruits for battlefield. As said, they had to imagine what it sounded like, and artillery fire was completely absent. Now, one battalion in France, when they received a large draft of men, did what they called a demonstration attack for the newly arrived men to accustom them to the sounds of artillery fire. What this was, was having them stand in a group whilst the battalion band made as much noise as possible with drums and cymbals. <laughs> the fact they thought that was meant to help the recruits kind of shows how little experience or not of noise and carnage they'd been exposed to before. Now, the result was many new drafts were prone to panic or breakdown when first exposed to enemy fire. F.A. Voigt recalled how one new draft under artillery fire for the first time, and I quote, stretched out at full length, trembling and sobbing hysterically, and clutching at the grass with hands that opened and closed in mad spasms, end quote. In contrast, their experienced sergeant was quite unafraid and had a rather bored look on his face. Now, moving on to what was happening at the front, fortunately, this was of far, far higher quality. Now, by the end of 1916, a relatively standardised approach to collective training had been embraced throughout the BEF. When withdrawn into reserve out of the line, formations frequently conducted exercises over replica German trenches. When they were selected for an actual military operation, 
They then advanced from these exercises to specific rehearsal attacks over exact replicas of the terrain. Now, there were multiple factors behind this. The BEF's updated doctrine was um, stressed the use of rehearsals, such as SS135, uh, published in 1916. There were continuing improvements in aerial photography. Uh, for example, a trench raid in November 1917. Every single one of 15 German dugouts was identified, as well as all but one of their machine gun and trench mortar positions. Probably significantly as well, if you look at the uh, table here, the percentage time men spent training at the front had massively increased in 1917 to over one third of their time. The reasons for this was the BEF possessed greater manpower than before, but also more machine guns, so they didn't have to hold the line as, as in greater strength, so they could withdraw more infantrymen at once and keep them training behind the lines. Now, despite having this relatively standardized approach, there were still significant inconsistencies. Some schemes involved enemy forces, some schemes involved no enemy forces. Some schemes involved soldiers simply walking through over like a taped out course. Others involved like a relatively realistic exercise, well, scheme with blank ammunition and occasionally live rounds. Though when live rounds were used, it was often a terrifying experience due to the rather lax health and safety standards of the day. Um, in the 51st Highland Division, one live firing scheme was, and I quote, not very successful as they forgot to clear the countryside beforehand and they nearly killed several French farmers and their horses who were working in the same field at the time. Uh, in probably an understatement, the war diary recorded that the divisional general was not best pleased. Um, and there's numerous accounts of casualties um, happening in live firing schemes. Uh, another problem is the differing quality of officers and commanders throughout the BEF. Commanding 18th Corps, General Sir I Lieutenant General at the time, Ivor Maxey, formed a very negative opinion of Major General Cuthbert, commanding 39th Division. And Maxey describes Cuthbert as not a successful commander with little or no conception of training methods. In contrast, Maxey praised Major, Major General George Harper, commanding the 51st Division, for transforming them from an ill-organized and unsoldier-like rabble into one of the two or three best divisions in Thra France through training. The most serious factor, though, was the time available for training. Even with the increased time on the board, it was not always possible to withdraw formations before a major battle for um, extended periods of rehearsal attacks. The biggest problem, though, was um, the BEF's high command and its approach to battle. Now, Spencer mentioned that the bite and hold approach, but in 1917, I'd rather say it was bite and break through. What would happen is at the opening of a major battle, such as um, Arras or Third Eep, there'd be months of extensive and elaborate preparations, which allowed for detailed and effective plans to be worked out from artillery barrages, logistical support and troop movements. Um, and this allowed formations to rehearse the attack in extensive detail. Prior to Arras, for example, men in the 9th Division spent February and March practicing over model trenches, recreated from aerial photographs. Um, real machine guns fired blank cartridges to represent the enemy, and artillery put down smoke barrages to imitate the creeping barrage soldiers were to follow. The Royal Flying Corps even took some soldiers into the air so they could see the effectiveness of trying to signal aircraft from the ground firsthand. Now, an officer in the division claimed they were better prepared for this attack than any in their history. And Cyril Falls in the official history um, pretty much accurately complains, uh, complains, accurately claims that the infantry had reached their highest standard of training since the start of the war. Now on 9th of April, this helped the BEF achieve what was their greatest success so far, advancing three and a half miles and capturing over 9,000 German prisoners. It's following this success though that the problems happen, with the BEF frequently abandoning methodical preparation in favor of hastily arranged and poorly planned follow-up attacks, which were often conducted at short notice without any detailed planning. At the same time, the German defenders would be reorganizing themselves and reinforcements would be arriving, uh, so the power balance usually had swung back to the defenders. 
and the result was frequently exceptionally heavy British losses for very little gain. At Arras, for example, the BEF continued to press forward as Haig and General Sir Edmund Allenby, commanding Third Army, believed they were pursuing a defeated enemy and that risks must be freely taken. In reality, the German reinforcements had arrived and the British forces were increasingly exhausted by ex um, just tiredness and heavy casualties. The 9th Division, who had prepared so diligently for the 9th of April, suffered the consequences of this three days later on the 12th, when the South African and 27th Brigade were ordered to attack the village of Fampu. At such short notice, they conducted zero reconnaissance, nor could they even establish telephone lines between the infantry and artillery. Now, there were widespread protests by the battalion brigades and divisional commanders about launching the attack, but they were forced to go ahead. And it ended in disaster, with the South Africans being mown down um, like a sickle through a cornfield, according to one survivor. Now, similar attacks continued throughout April, and even though there was a little pause around the 15th after a couple of divisional um, commanders basically went on strike. And this culminated with the Third Battle of the Scarp on 3 May 1917. And if you're interested in this battle, I recommend a fantastic chapter 12 in Spencer Jones's uh, 1917, The Darkest Year. But at Third Scarp, uh, the British infantry was a mixture of exhausted veterans and these newly arrived raw drafts. And 10 of the 12 attacking divisions had been involved in fighting throughout April. Yet the attack was launched at such short notice, it precluded any meaningful reconnaissance, planning or training. The 18th Division, um, who would probably set the benchmark for rehearsal attacks before the first day of the Battle of the Somme, the only preparatory training they managed was one officer briefly outlining the plan of attack over a map to his men, with no contingencies in case the attack did not proceed as planned. Finally, at less than 24 hours notice, in possibly his least defensible decision of the war, Haig made it the decision that the attack was to move from a dawn attack to one at night in pitch black, something no type of soldier, something none of the soldiers were trained for, and which required a completely different approach as they wouldn't be able to see where they were going. Together, this meant that the infantry fighting the opening day battles usually had a far higher overall level of collective training than those fighting the follow-up attacks. And this shows that whilst the BEF had made major improvements in increasing the consistency and quantity of collective training men received, there were still significant weaknesses in 1917. So now we need to um, talk about what the actual effect of this training was. And I'm going to start with tactical, well, overall I'm gonna show that for battles that were carefully pr uh, planned and prepared for, collective training proved capable of quickly and effectively transforming even the rawest drafts into soldiers more than capable of achieving battlefield success by increasing their tactical cohesion and staying power. Now this training was a key part in many of the BEF's most notable successes, However, when soldiers were rushed into attacks with no extensive collective training, the opposite was true, with weak tactical cohesion and poor staying power often ensuring or exacerbating an attack's failure. So starting with tactical cohesion, one of the most simple difficulties here was maintaining direction during an advance. No man's land is a mass of mud, well, at Third Eep at least, a mud, mud shell holes, and you're under fire, it's quite hard to uh, maintain your orientation. Now, when the infantry didn't know the ground they were attacking over, such as in rushed follow-up attacks, they often lost direction and tactical cohesion collapsed. An example of this is at Third Scarp, um, with the 9th Division, where it's exacerbated by being conducted in pitch black. Now, one battalion in the Scottish Division is confused by a series of German flares that go off off to their right. And they swing that way, which brings them across the front of another British battalion who open fire on them thinking they're the Germans and inflict heavy casualties. Another battalion um, becomes so hopelessly lost, they pivot then to their right and advance on their own trenches firing from the hip. Um, so somehow managed to capture the British front line. <clears throat> 
this is even more disastrous because the reserves who are following that battalion don't know the battalion in front of them has got lost. They think there's a battalion in front of them and because there's no fighting, it's all clear. So they stumble into a German trench which is manned with defenders not expecting it and get mown down in essence. However, through rehearsal attacks in particular, if the infantry were taught their objectives and the layout of the land, they usually maintain direction effectively. At 3rd Eep, the 58th Division stressed the importance of rehearsal attacks, saying they cannot be overestimated, and there is a no doubt they helped to a great extent to achieve the successes gained, as the men knew the exact distances they had to travel and the relation one objective bears to another. The only problem the British infantry faced in these examples was when the artillery destroyed the German position so effectively they, rec they were unrecognisable from those the men practised over. The most critical aspect of tactical cohesion though was the infantry's ability to act with the other arms, with combined arms being key in 1917. Now the most obvious form this took was with the artillery and the creeping barrage. Now here the difference between success and failure on the battlefield was measured in seconds. If the infantry failed to follow a creeping barrage closely and lost what was known as the race to the parapet, they could expect to be met with a withering German machine gun and rifle fire and suffer exceptionally heavy casualties. If, however, they flo closely followed the barrage and entered the German position before the defenders could get their machine guns into action, they usually achieved what was a relatively easy victory in terms of the First World War. Now, the difference here between success and failure was usually down to collective training. In March 1917, the second division had practiced its men extensively in following a creeping barrage, usually represented by drums, and its men thoroughly realized its importance and ne the need to keep up to it. When they attacked Grevillea's trench, the men f closely followed it and reached the German parapet just as the enemy was mounting his machine guns and eliminated them before they could open fire. The division's war diary noted that success, and I quote, was obviously a question of seconds, and had the men not been trained to be right up to the barrage, many casualties must have been inc incurred, end quote. Now the effectiveness of the British infantry in closely following the creeping barrage, thanks to collective training, was key throughout 1917, such as at Arras, um, Third Ape and Messines, it all played an important role. Um, but it wasn't perfect, uh, well, sorry. But um, coming to the end of the year, we also see probably what was the hardest challenge for collective training's ability to build tactical cohesion in the war, which was the Battle of Cambrai, uh, which launched on 20th of November, 1917. As I'm sure most of you are aware, here the BEF trialed a brand new approach to warfare where they dispensed with a creeping barrage in favour of the men following behind 400 tanks. Now, for the infantry, this was completely new. Most of them have never fought with tanks before or in close cooperation with them, and they had to be in taught a completely novel approach because they had to follow at a different pace in different formations and be prepared to deal with different eventualities. Now, to allow this, each attacking division before the battle was allotted 10 days for collective training, and most made full use of this. They would recommend Bryn Hammond's book on the battle for a more detailed study. The 51st Division, for example, performed numerous rehearsals, sometimes with the actual tanks, sometimes with tank officers representing their vehicles, and carefully explained the role the men were to play to them and how they were to navigate the battlefield. Further cohesion was fostered through frequent meetings between the tanks and, tank and infantry officers and NCOs, which allowed both arms to get to know one another, how they worked and their strengths and weaknesses. When the attack began, the 51st Division reaped the rewards of this training, with both soldiers and tanks understanding each other's roles and objective clearly. And when there was close cooperation between tanks and infantry, success was prompt and complete. Now this helped result in the BEF advancing four miles in places and capturing over 4,000 German prisoners. There were, however, limitations to training's effectiveness in building tactical cohesion, particularly amongst the infantry and artillery. And the reason for this was a lack of realism. Um, there was no way to actually represent a real creeping barrage in training. Um, 
It was accepted in battle. You'd take a few casualties from your own creeping barrage if you were close enough. You can't really justify that in training. And the artillery pieces that would fire the creeping barrage were usually pointed towards the German line rather than 20 miles behind in a training area. So during schemes, the artillery barrage was usually represented either by a series of officers and other ranks carrying a line of flags or occasionally drums and in Scottish formations, bagpipes. Very rarely they used smoke shells, such as I mentioned with the 9th Division at Arras, to simulate the barrage. Now in any case, there was never the same level of noise, confusion, or general carnage caused by artillery fire on the ground. But the biggest problem though was schemes frequently failed to consider that there was an error margin for each artillery gun firing the creeping barrage. Now Roland Fielding, um, serving at the front, noted in a letter home that rather than a smooth wall of shells, most creeping barrages were an irregular and varying belt, and it required the infantry to visually follow it. You had to look in front of you and see where the shells were la uh, la uh, landing and exploding and judge the distance and follow it. Unfortunately, during training, with the line of flags, they often moved at a very steady and uniform pace. And rather than learning to visually follow the creeping barrage, the infantry just learnt to time their pace of advance so they'd proceed along with the lifts. Now, another problem with flags is there's no penalty for running into them. If you run into a line of flags during a training exercise, oh dear. If you run into your actual creeping barrage during a bat battle, you're probably either wounded or killed. Now, this exacerbated what is also known as forward panic. And this is a human reaction when you're in a high stress environment. It's kind of the opposite of what we'd call cowardice. Instead of running away, you run towards the danger to get it over with as quickly as possible. If you imagine standing on a 10 metre diving board, it's the sprinting at the far end and yelling Geronimo as you bomb dive off the end um, is probably a forward panic. And the result was in many instances, British troops ran into their own barrage, suffering heavy casualties as they just weren't um, good at judging the distance and they didn't know the consequences of the panic. And the 9th Division in particular seem adept at this. They seem to, ev after every major offensive they take, despite being one of the best regarded divisions in the BF, every entry in their war diary is our men got too close to the barrage and suffered, heavy casual uh, suffered unnecessary casualties. But to highlight um, the problem this posed, I'm going to cheat slightly and use the capture of Beaumont Hamill in November 1916 as an example, which breaks the 1917 theme of this uh, conference so slightly. But during the opening attack on the 13th of November by the 51st Division, um, they'd performed extensive collective training and their men closely followed the barrage and entered the German line as it lifted. And by the end of the day, the attack was completely successful with 2,000 German prisoners captured for little loss. Two days later, however, the division failed in a follow-up attack as its infantry ran into their own barrage and suffered severe losses, which were sufficient to totally disorganize the attack. Now, the reason for this was errors in their training. For the first attack, the men had been taught to follow a barrage that crept forward in 100 yards lifts. And as I mentioned, they simply learned to walk forward at the correct pace to manage this. They didn't learn to judge the distance themselves. On the second day, on the two days later, on the follow-up attack, the barrage crept forward at a different pace. And still thinking they could advance at the same rate, the men ran into it. Fifth Army, under which the division was operating, was very quick to apportion blame, stating, and I quote, it is not clear why the infantry had been trained to think that 100-yard lifts are normal, and they should have been trained to keep close to the barrage rather than worry about timings. These weaknesses could, however, still be ameliorated simply by emphasizing the problems to the infantry during training. If you actually explain to them like you need to follow this visually rather than just simply learning the rate of advance. And an example of this is the 18th Division in October 1916 when they capture Regina Trench. Now, before the battle, the 18th Division had emphasized how to visually follow the barrage. And this proved highly effective. 
the division captured the German trench with an artillery observer reporting how so well the troops followed the barrage that there was a noticeable indentation in the British line of advance where a couple of guns were firing short. Now this shows that a high level of tactical cohesion was achievable even within the limited realism of collective training as long as troops learnt to follow a creeping barrage by, look at, by looking at where the she shells were falling. The biggest weakness with collective training though was that the infantry simply couldn't rely on other arms in every battle, especially creeping barrages. At Third Eep in particular, it was found in the, uh, once it became a muddy quagmire, the infantry certainly couldn't keep up uh, the sufficient rate of advance to keep up with their barrage, and the barrage would lift off the German positions, the Germans would emerge and shoot down the British infantry struggling in the mud. The most common reason for the creeping barrage's failure, though, was rushed planning and preparation, often in follow-up attacks. At Fampu, as previously mentioned, there was no wet time for reconnaissance, no time for planning, and there was no communication between the infantry and artillery. And as soon as the attack begins, the uh, creeping barrage is weak, ragged, and the infantry lose it and suffer heavy casualties from German fire. Furthermore, after the opening day of Arras, the Germans also moved to a new defence in depth approach, where rather than a solid connect connected line of trenches, they now occupy a number of unconnected defensive positions, such as fortified shell, hole shell holes, hedgerows, concrete pillboxes and redoubts. Now these positions were isolated and mutually supportive, which were more challenging for the artillery to suppress, but also the infantry couldn't simply enter them and bomb their way forward like they could with a connected trench line. Now this was the semi-open warfare that Kennedy mentioned in the introduction. And in this warfare, victory hinged on the infantry's ability to fight forward by itself through fire and maneuver, just as the regulars had pre-war. The problem was, up till the middle of 1917, collective training completely neglected this possibility. Now this was a long stemming thing from the over course of 1915 and 16. Collective training had moved from fire and movement in the open um, into in favour of relying on the artillery and trench warfare. The problems had been noted, this post had been noted during the Somme, but little had been done to address it up till Arras. Furthermore, the traditional British tactic of advancing in waves was not particularly effective in semi-open warfare anymore, as men couldn't exploit terrain or cover effectively and were vulnerable to enemy fire. And as the regulars of 1914 had struggled to suppress German machine guns with their rifles, there was little hope for the untrained drafts of 1917 to do likewise. Now this was completely exposed at Arras, with it becoming apparent that the infantry couldn't, if the infantry couldn't follow a creeping barrage, they possessed neither the skills nor confidence in themselves to continue fighting their way forward. Major General Cecil Pereira, who uh, Spencer Jones has edited um, the papers of, I'm not angling for a job here, I swear, but uh, commanding second division reported that whilst our troops are excellently trained to attack under a barrage, and in this respect are much superior to the Germans, they suffer in comparison when called upon to carry out a manoeuvre in semi-open warfare. The 18th Division likewise reported that whilst its men were thoroughly conversant with trench warfare, in semi-open warfare they became, and I quote, sticky, which in a wonderful analogy was akin to the attitude of an individual without clothes being suddenly driven from the privacy of his boudoir into the limelight of the public gaze. Now, as a result, many British attacks broke down or suffered unnecessarily heavy casualties in this kind of fighting. Now, for me, this I don't necessarily view as a failing of training itself. Rather, it's a failing of the BEF's command who put the infantry in a position it was not trained for. Blaming training for the poor performance of the British infantry in semi-open warfare during the first half of 1917 is more an example of a worker blaming his tools rather than himself. This weakness needed solving though. Um, one solution was giving greater weight to training men in open warfare situations, but most importantly was the emergence of platoon tactics, which really kind of 
They're a present before Arras, but it's really after the Battle of Arras they become commonplace. Now, turning the platoon into an army in miniature with rifle grenades, Lewis guns, and hand grenades empowered the infantry by giving them the tools and tactics necessary to fight their way forward by themselves. And platoon tactics were quickly incorporated into the existing approach to collective training. So exercises, instead of focusing on creeping barrage, simply follow on platoon tactics. Fielding described one exercise where each man was um, drilled in their role so specifically when under inspection by the army commander, one man was asked if he was a Catholic, to which he responded, I'm a rifleman, sir. Now, in many formations, this training proved highly effective in preparing men for semi-open warfare. And there's countless examples during Third Epe of this. In 13th Corps, for an example, they allotted each platoon specific pillboxes and machine gun emplacements to deal with before rehearsing their capture numerous times behind the lines. Now the 51st Division stressed the, um, the effectiveness of this training in its report on the opening attack on 31st of July, saying that it enabled the infantry and effectively, and in most cases promptly, to carry out their tasks with rifle grenades saving the situation again and again. <coughs> A particularly strong example of effective tactical cohesion was the 6th Battalion Seaforth Highlanders, who when confronted by a strong under-destroyed, um, that's their word, emplacement from which two machine guns played, they got their Lewis gun to work in front suppressing it, whilst rifle grenadiers and riflemen worked round to the rear. What could have been an insurmountable, object, um, insurmountable obstacle in Arras was quickly captured with 25 prisoners taken. It wasn't all positive though, and again, I'm gonna come back to this, this was often due to the BEF's high command, making the infantry perform impossible tasks. The battles of Paul Capel and the first battle of Passchendaele were launched at very short notice on 9th of 12th October, with far less preparation than many previous operations. Incessant rain had turned the battlefield into a quagmire, which greatly restricted the infantry's maneuverability as well. The result of both battles was inevitably disastrous, with exceptionally heavy casualties for very little gain. And there was no amount of training that could overcome these critical weaknesses undermining the attack. The 49th Division was lectured by a staff officer who told them to creep up behind German pillboxes and then rush them. As one officer cynically remarked, this worked well enough on paper, but in reality our men were wading waist deep in mud while well, the Germans, high and dry in their pillboxes, simply shot them down. At Cambrai too, for example, the attrition rate amongst the tanks was so high that by the latter stages of the opening day, there were none left to support the 51st Division's infantry when they reached the village of Flesquieres. Here, because of the lack of creeping barrage, the German wire was uncut, and the German defenders were a strong force with numerous machine guns. Um, which proved too much for the Highlanders to capture and they were forced back. Now here there was virtually zero chance of the infantry being able to carry a defensive position complete with unbroken barbed wire without support from other arms. So throughout this period with tactical cohesion, collective training could consistently produce high enough levels to attain victory, but weaknesses in the BEF's approach often meant there were examples where poor tactical cohesion helped guarantee a lack of success. Now, no matter how skilled the infantry were though, nor how closely they cooperated with other arms, they still needed staying power. Heavy casualties, particularly amongst officers, were inevitable. Now, in his work on combat psychology, James Roberts claims that officers were the key to making men go forward. For one, they provided leadership, with Roberts claiming the small group who reached the German wire were collected and led by junior commanders, whereas the company that lost all its officers mostly went to ground. Just as importantly, if officers were the only ones who knew the plans and objectives of an operation, if they became casualties, the men might not know what they needed to do or where to go. This was a critical problem, for because officers were expected to lead from the front, as I'm sure you're all aware, and suffered a far higher casualty rate relative to the other ranks. 
and it was commonplace for the majority, if not all officers leading an attack to become casualties during an advance, which could cause it to lose all its cohesion. I'll mention that man again, but Spencer Jones placed great emphasis on this aspect in 1915, writing how officer casualties and the resulting confusion had lain at the heart of many battlefield disasters. Now this was still a problem in 1917, and tactical cohesion could easily break down if collective training had not prepared men with the knowledge to carry out their operations without their officers. In May, the 21st Division at Arras, where they hadn't been able to um, perform any rehearsals, noted that when the officer becomes a casualty, the men of a platoon are lost, as the plan of attack and the nature of the country over which they were attacking had not been explained. Fortunately, such instances were far rarer than in previous years, as the importance of preparing the infantry for this eventuality through collective training was clearly understood. If you look at SS135 and other doctrinal pamphlets, they will all stress the, uh, the importance of preparing the infantrymen to continue without officers. Captain F.C. Hitchcock recorded in his diary how in one exercise, every single officer and NCO in his battalion fell out and pretended to be casualties to test the men's ability to continue the attack. It revealed the men were not a, but not a bit flustered and they carried on spl uh, splendidly. Likewise, Private C.R. Smith entered in his diary that the reason they we kept doing the same thing over and over again in rehearsal attacks is to get everyone acquainted with the method of working on his own initiative in case of commanders becoming casualties. No excuse to say you did not know. Now, numerous examples throughout 1917 attest to the British infantry's ability to continue advancing even after all their officers had become casualties. Uh, on the opening day of Arras, the 5th Seaforths recorded how two platoons lost all their officers in the very early stages of their advance, yet continued over the first and second German lines before being held up by German machine gun fire from a third trench line. Now, according to Roberts' rules, they should probably have gone to ground with no one to lead them here. But nonetheless, they continued working forward despite suffering heavy casualties and eventually forced the Germans to surrender. Perhaps the best example I've come across though is the little known Battle of Boom Ravine in February 1917 and the 11th Battalion Royal Fusiliers in 18th Division. Now, just as they're forming up for the morning attack in their trenches, the Germans, knowing it's coming, meet them with an annihilating bombardment, which inflicts massive casualties. And at zero hour, only two of 14 officers are actually available to lead the attack, both of whom were quickly killed once in no man's land. Now, again, by Robert's rule, this attack should have quickly floundered. However, just three days spent in rehearsals had proved sufficient for the Fusiliers infantrymen to know their objective and their role on the battlefield, and they pressed forward undaunted and fought their way into the German trench system and captured over 100 prisoners. They then moved on to take the second German trench system, only to be forced back eventually by a counterattack. By all accounts, this attack should have failed, yet the fact it didn't showed both the men's doggedness and dash but also the importance of providing them with the knowledge necessary to continue with no officers to guide or direct them. Another benefit of collective training was it built men's confidence in their own ability to achieve victory. Hitchcock wrote in his diary that, for example, in trench raids, success depends entirely on every man having a definite role and knowing it thoroughly, as when a man knows his job, he has confidence in himself. Should he not know it, he is liable through ignorance to get windy and cause alarm amongst his companions, turning the raid into a failure. Now, rarely the inverse was true and collective training could lower men's confidence by making clear there was little chance of success in a forthcoming operation. This was certainly the case at 30 with the examples I've mentioned of men being told to flank pillboxes when they knew they'd be stuck in the mud. Overall though, collective training um, usually improved men's confidence before major attacks and this helped build and sustain their what was known as the time as spirit which is a combination of morale motivation and discipline in contemporary terms 
So to bring it all to a conclusion, in 1917, collective training in the British Army and BEF was what I'd call a mixed bag. Um, the training recruits received in Britain was largely ineffective, but at the front, collective training proved consistently capable of building sufficient tactical cohesion and staying power in the British infantry to enable battlefield success. This was often key to the BEF's most notable successes and helped them master the trench attack. Collective training was not perfect though, and limitations in how realistically schemes represented actual battle often caused hiccups, though these could be overcome. The one consistent weakness of training, though, was the BEF's approach to military operations. Whilst major battles often began with careful preparation, um, which allowed for detailed rehearsals and exercises, rushed follow-up attacks with no preparatory training completely undermined the infantry's ability to achieve victory. Furthermore, when the highly trained soldiers who began the battle inevitably started losing end to casualties, they were replaced by the untrained drafts fresh from Britain. As a result, the longer a battle went on, the less collective training prepared soldiers for success. This is not to say collective training was ineffective, rather it is a condemnation of the BEF's high command and their inability to recognize the strengths and weaknesses of the training system and the infantry they had at their disposal. Thank you very much. Thank you.